I feel very honored to be presenting uh, to this austere group of people with hearts that are oriented to helping everyone flourish, everyone uh, feel dignified and be treated with respect. My earliest memories are of disrespect of children and uh, I have been wondered all my life what's wrong with the world and more recently I have worked in multiple fields and discovered what's wrong and what to do. So my um, work is going to then give you this information. So I'm going to have some bad news, you know, some bad news, and some good news though. Uh, so let's get started. We have lots of tools at uh, evolvednest.org for you to use, which I'll bring up. Uh, uh, so you know the bad news. What's the bad news? We have ill being is spreading all over the world. Illness, mental, physical. Uh, we have climate instability, uh, global warming. We have toxifying soil, air, water, food. And our systems of the planet are breaking down. And mass extinction of species. These are just a few of the problems that all of a sudden we have a mega crisis. But we have good news. Okay, so my presentation, presentation is trying to wake us up to the good news, which is we can identify now where we went wrong as a species and what is needed to return to wellness. So this is one piece of that. You all have pieces too that you know uh, need to come together to get us back into the pathway for wellness. So first, we have a six-minute film that we created that gives you the big picture. The film always makes me cry. Um, <clears throat> I should tell you that I am giving you the perspective from the United States. The United States is very bad for well-being. It's very bad for dignity. And so what you see is the worst case scenario, which too many people are experiencing in the United States, but also where the colonization, corporate colonization goes, right? It ends up being this very <clears throat> destructive, competitive detachment because people forget how to be cooperative if they're not raised that way. It takes a lot of healing to get back to our core nature of compassion and attunement and social intelligence. Yeah? I'll do it. I'll do it. <laughs> okay. uh, so, that gives you a big picture of it. The uh, bad news, you know, the good news, and then how do we get back? Uh, let's see if it works. Did you put the... I did, but somehow it just oh. doesn't have me. Okay, this is fine. Good. Can you move me a little yeah. bit? Yeah, thank you. So, just more detail now on the bad news. <laughs> okay. The cycle of competitive detachment induces trauma from the beginning of life. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And so in the United States, we have extreme social poverty. Uh, you might have economic wealth, um, you know, overall, but a lot of people don't have economic wealth either. And so what happens in number one, is, oh, not yet, I'm doing it, I think. Okay, so under care is we have the wrong kind of child raising. We forgot what it should be for our species. Every animal has a nest, we do too, uh, and we kind of forgot that with industrialization, colonization. I'm going to talk about that. What happened, oh, yeah. don't touch until I tell you. <laughs> So then number two, what happens is you get dysregulated. Your biology doesn't quite coordinate with your psychology. Uh, your brain doesn't develop fully. And you don't have all your capacities as a, as a human being. So you have a feeling of scarcity, insecurity. Something's not right. You don't feel um, your, your body and your mind take your attention. And you can't be open to others because you're distressed and dysregulated. 
and you become traumatized and reactive to threats because that's the way your body has been designed. If you're left in distress as a baby, then you just get oriented that way, you've enhanced those systems. And so you end up with adults who are not well, and they have limited social moral capacities. You get very self-protective when you don't feel well. And we develop then exclusionary morality, us versus them, them others, those others, right? And what happens is these adults create the culture that keeps this going. The adults are distracted, they're overwhelmed, they're neglectful, or they over-control. You know, they don't have a balanced way of being. Okay, now. So what happens physiologically? We know that all sorts of systems are developed in the first three years, especially, but the first six years. And then there's sensitive periods, other times, adolescence, early adolescence, late adolescence. You're still growing your brain capacity so you can intervene. Uh, so the stress response, um, when, when that kicks in, uh, you're, you can't think very well. The blood flow changes so you can run or fight. Yeah, so when that's early stress, when you leave babies alone, leave them to cry, don't give them enough of a nest, their stress response system will not be in good shape. The immune system also, endocrine system like the oxytocin system, which is the cuddle hormone, all sorts of things just don't get developed well. So let's keep going. I'm not going to read all the slides to you. You can come back and look. Um, what happens psychologically? You learn to distrust your body. You don't trust your intuitions because you haven't developed them well, because your caregivers didn't trust your intuitions. Because every baby is born with a compass of wellness. They're oriented to growing well. But then when they're left alone, punished, uh, and isolated, uh, or left in distress, they stop trusting themselves. They're not going to trust the caregivers, and they're not going to trust the world, right? So it's a whole impaired sense of self. You learn to live against the others because they lived against you. So you mirror what you experience, and you can become disagreeable and distrust others and so on. Another way to look at it is if you think of the chakras, the energy centers in your body, is you get stuck then. This is what happens in the United States now. People are, feel very insecure because their needs were not met when they were babies. They feel numb and they have self-doubt. When the Dalai Lama came to the United States the first time, he said, what is wrong with everyone? Because they're stuck here, many people, even the wealthy. So it's not a matter of poverty, it's a matter of social poverty. What happens then face to face? My area is moral development. How do we decide morality? How do we live in moral ways, ethical ways that are um, inclusive? What's the optimal way to live? Well, when your physiology, your brain systems are not well established, you're going to easily go into a self-protective mindset. When you meet somebody, you think, oh, are they smarter than me? Are they handsomer than me? Are they stronger than me? And you decide whether you can dominate or whether you have to withdraw and submit. Yeah, so we have all these built-in systems that get enhanced in babyhood with under care, lack of the evolved nest. Okay, and then when we use our intellect, our abstract thinking, the ability to think outside the present moment, so not face to face, we start to use these controlling imaginations. So vicious imagination is, I want to control you. I want to dominate you. And so I create systems of domination and laws of domination. Or you become a professor <laughs> and you detach and think of all these models in your head in the castle, you know, in the ivory tower, and you think, oh, this is a good model, and you impose it on the world, but you're not relationally connected. You're not emotionally connected. Instead, you have, you've divorced yourself from life often. Okay, so these are the kinds of things that happen then. We get caught up, our schooling pushes us on the right side uh, because it seems right, it seems logical. 
So, in each situation, this is um, what happens. You feel, you decide whether you feel safe or not. In every situation, it happens very quickly. If you feel unsafe, this is very subconscious, you move against, you move to the right. You get defensive. And you, you, uh, you know, that domination, oh, I'm going to show them how smart I am, right, or how strong I am. And you brace against openness and fluidity. Or if you feel safe, you attune to the others. You find them beautiful. You see the uniqueness there. You make a new dance with this new person. And you're open to life. This is our heritage on the left. But what happens when you are under care for is you spend more time on the right side. Now you can also spend time from your thoughts. If you've been told green people are scary, green people are dangerous, ooh, you see a green person, boom, you go on the other side. Mm. So if you've been told the stories about danger of certain things, right, you go over there. So okay, there's another... So on the right side, this is trauma-informed. That's a very important idea in the United States today. So many people have been traumatized, so now schools, businesses want to prevent triggers that put you over on the right side. So they talk about trauma-informed practice. Next. But to what we need also is the next, just the arrow. There. Back. There. The left side is wellness informed. So that's what the Evolve Nest gives us an idea of how we should be as a species, what's optimal. And so you need to understand that this is our optimality, not this. This is what happens. We look more like chimpanzees when you're under cared for, <laughs> right? You want to dominate. But no, that's not our heritage. So, it's time to remember what our ancestors knew intuitively and science now confirms. Go. Most of our humanity we're not born with, it's grown after birth, it's postnatal. That means you have to have certain experiences to grow the brain properly. All these kinds of things, self-regulation, receptive intelligence, how to live well on Earth. And we are one of the few animals that are very immature at birth, highly immature. Full-term birth is 40, 42 weeks usually. A lot of babies now are pulled out by doctors early, so they're actually premature because of the misunderstanding. Babies spend uh, vary by how long they stay in the womb by 55 days. If they had a choice, some babies would come out 55 days later than other babies. But doctors don't give them a choice. They say, oh, this is the due date. So then you have now messed up the baby already. And most of the brain, it's okay, most of the brain is grown after birth. So over millions of years, we evolved a system to foster wellness. And it takes us 30 years or so to get to adulthood. So we need the nestedness that I'm going to talk about especially in the first 30 years, especially in the first year, first three years, first six years, but uh, otherwise we can't reach our fullness. We'll, so we have a deep ancestry of wellness. The um, San people, the Efe, uh, they have been around for 150,000 years. Hunter-gatherer civilization at least that long. And you can see in the way that they behave how well they are, how um, they thrive, and they're empathic, and caring, and forgiving, and flexible, and autonomous, highly free, but also communal. They always think of the community well-being. All right, so what does it look like? You saw the cycle of connected cooperative companionship. You provide that companionship, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, from conception. That builds a healthy psychosocial neurobiology, big words there, right? Just all the systems of the body, the psyche, the spirit are well constructed and coordinated. You end up with adults who are well, and they become wise. 
and then those adults uh, create a community. Oops, not yet. Create a community. Back. Back. Sorry. <laughs> create a community that attends to basic needs and respectful relations. And this happens all with the Earth in mind, not apart from Earth, not floating above Earth like the colonization societies do. It's like we don't. We're going to go to Mars and we'll live the same way, right? And it's like, wait a minute. Come on, take care of Earth here, right? Okay. So this is the evolved nest, you saw it um, in the film. The first two are only for babies, usually, young children, uh, soothing perinatal and on request breastfeeding, but the rest of them are for all of us. So take a moment now and think. Your own experience, we have asked adults these things. How much positive touch or affection did you receive in your childhood? How much negative touch, spanking, corporal punishment, did you feel welcome, positive climate, by your community, your family? How about play? How much self-directed play did you get? Were you free to roam around? How about allo mothers or other nurturers? Did you have more than mother, more than mother and father? How about responsive relationships? Did they listen to you? Were you did you feel like they cared for you and knew you? And the nature connection, were you able to be outside and connect to trees and animals and water? And then did you practice healing practices when you were growing up? So now keep that in mind about your own experience. We'll come back later. So what happens with wellness then, if you think of the chakras again, you have all these things that have developed well. You have security, creativity. Confidence, love, sharing, intuition, and oneness. This is our heritage. To be this way is species normal. <clears throat> and what happens then face to face, instead of bracing against the other and I'm going to win or I'm going to withdraw? No. You are able to relationally engage. You're flexible. You're fully present. You're not preoccupied with your own worries. You're not depressed, you're not anxious, and you resonate with the other, and your ego is small. Your ego is, you know, embraces the other, instead of this big protective ego, oh, I have to be the one, you know, this particular way to be me. No, you're flexible. <clears throat> and when you use your thinking skills outside the present moment, your imagination is communal. You think of how to build the community, how to be <clears throat> inclusive, how to show compassion. This is our heritage. <clears throat> so what the Evolve Nest does, and it helps you meet basic needs, it's actually love in action. If you want to love a baby, you provide the Evolve Nest. And it's not just mother. It's not just mother and father that provide the Evolve Nest. It's the community, it's the village. And the African traditions are very clear on this. They know this. And uh, in other traditional communities around the world. So these practices are mostly over 75 million years old. We uh, hominins have been around for 2 million years. Our species for 300,000 years. But look at these practices are in other animals. Other animals and even insects have Practices, they have a nest that optimizes their normal development. So I see it as a cultural commons for creating, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, sorry, <laughs> for building human nature. And what happens in early life then? Your emotions, your thinking, yourself, your social worldview, all is built from your immersed experience. Okay. So the brain, the body, the mind develop together in the early years. We resemble fetuses until 18 months of age. We, like, we are like newborns of other animals. Uh, I'm sorry, like fetuses of other animals until we're 18 months of age. So we need an external womb experience. We need to have needs met quickly. We need to, uh, we are going to self-actualize through self-organization. The baby is building their personality and their skills around their experience. And so there's a constant interaction between nature and nurture. You can't separate them. It's an illusion. So epigenetic things. Things are being turned on and off based on experience. 
Our biology is built by our social experience, and then our social abilities are built, are based on our biology. So we need a womb with a view. Okay. Boys especially need the womb the, with a view. They especially need the evolved nest. They mature more slowly. They have less built-in resilience. They're more vulnerable to social trauma. <clears throat> and endocrine disruptors like plastics in the food or water. And their stress regulation develops more slowly. And so if they don't have the evolved nest, if you leave them in distress, uh, babies, uh, boy babies are more likely then to develop addictions, autism, attention deficit disorders, antisocial behavior, schizophrenia, reactivity, aggression, violence. So we have now created a system where we undercare for boys, and then we say, oh, well, that's normal male behavior, to be aggressive. No, we forgot. So in the early years, the right hemisphere is growing more rapidly. It's scheduled to, and that's our social intelligence, our emotional intelligence, our ability to see life in its dynamic flow. Left hemisphere is oriented to static categories, right? And so that's unfortunate. What, uh, what we emphasize in industrialized cultures is the left brain, and we undermine then the development here. <clears throat> I'm going to just go quickly through two, the first two, so you know, that in the pre, uh, perinatal, so that means pre-birth, birth, and post-birth period, perinatal, the expectant mother needs to feel supported. And she needs to have good nutrition, no toxins, baby needs to decide their birthday, not the doctor, and birth needs to follow the natural rhythms of mother and child, because they're built in to help each other get through the, um, the birth process with even ecstasy. I have mothers coming into my, uh, my classes and they'll say, oh, I wish I could give birth every year because it was so ecstatic. It's like, whoa, you don't see that on television, do you? <laughs> so if you allow the processes and don't interfere with drugs, because then that undermines all sorts of connecting bonding hormones if you give, uh, you know, labor drugs and others. So, and the hormones protect the mom and baby from toxic stress. So baby needs to come on the mother's skin right away afterwards, and then they can both calm down, they relax into deep bonding. And they should be cared for for weeks. Traditionally, the new mother, new baby, are waited on in traditional societies. They're so that they can actually bond and grow together. <clears throat> so baby placed on belly, and the babies will, in natural birth, crawl up the belly of the mother, start the, the uh, milk flow by uh, stimulating the nipple, and wow, talk about confidence building, right? Oh, I can do this. Uh, and then they are responding to, their needs are met quickly, so baby feels, ah, this is a good place to be in this world. I can do it, right? Um, blah, 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 there's more stuff there, keep going. So until about age three is this really important period for building the health system, the immune system, the endocrine system. And it goes, and we call it the primal health adaptation. And after that, you're going to have to, if you didn't get the good support, you'll have to get some therapy. So let's go on. We have tools at EvolveNest.org to help uh, parents and caregivers pay attention to the babies. So Day one, there's one thing to do. Day two, another thing. Day three, 28 days. We have 28 days of different things. Go ahead. And one of the major nerves of the body that um, affects all systems is the vagus nerve. It's very popular now in the United States for healing. And it's stimulated by breastfeeding, because the vagus nerve runs here. Belly breathing, we can all do that. Laughing, touch, singing, yoga and so on. So, let's go on. So breastfeeding is one of those things. Breast milk is just amazing. It's an elixir. It changes all day long, changes by gender, whether it's boy or girl, time of day, energizing hormones in the morning, sleep-inducing hormones in the evening, 
develops an antibody for any infection in the, in the neighborhood, is 80% alive, is antimicrobial, so it protects the gut from um, infection because it, uh, it provides a biofilm, kills pain. It's, uh, our milk is thin, not thick like predator milk. So there's low fat, low protein, and it builds the brain. So it needs to be ingested frequently because the brain is growing so fast. Uh, and it also shapes the jaw and palate. We have lots of people, when we don't breast, get breastfed, our jaw doesn't develop properly. And then we have sleep problems later because the palate is too thin, too narrow, and then you have tooth problems as well. So breastfeeding, magic. Our, this is an interesting chart. So just notice how long, this is years of breastfeeding on the, on the y-axis. Here we have different models. This is Bonobo's chimpanzees, our cousins. They breastfeed until six years on average. And then most of the time we'll stop at around four. And here in the, uh, the anthropologists show us, it goes even further, much further than six to eight years. And um, the average age of weaning is also four for our species, which I think Modern mothers say, what? <laughs> uh, biologically, which should be six years. And then look at this one. This is peaceful societies um, in a study of, of hundreds of <clears throat> societies around the world. Two and a half years of breastfeeding plus carrying children was linked to no war. And I'll just keep going. Yeah. All right. So now you uh, think back on your own experiences. So healthy development begins with the evolved nest, but then it's sustained for all of us. We all need affection, touch, welcoming, climate. Like we matter, belong. Nature, erosion, and connection, healing practices. So just very quickly to go through them. Touch, lots of things happen with good touch. Long-lasting benefits, prevents excessive stress. It prevents depression and Negative touch has long-term negative effects on people. Go ahead. I'm just quickly saying these ones. These. A welcoming social climate, right? You should feel welcome. I'll just read this um, quote from Liedloff, Jean Liedloff. The feeling appropriate to an infant in arms is his feeling of rightness or essential goodness. The premise that he is right, good, and welcome. Without that conviction, a human being of any age is crippled by a lack of confidence a full sense of self, of spontaneity, of grace. And we can see all over the United States this problem. Okay. So a supportive social climate allows the child to build their way of life through the world. They have freedom, they're treated with dignity, and they learn from just experimenting. And all sorts of things then develop through an ongoing experience of connectedness. Never isolated, never punished, never um, left in distress. Always connecting. Play. All sorts of good things happen in play. Uh, genes are turned on and off and, and make you more social, help you control aggression, uh, and your um, ability to recognize what the other is going to do and, and react to things that you didn't expect them to do. You learn all sorts of what we call executive functions to get along with others. And I always recommend for adults who did not have nestedness, play. Find a child under age seven and go play with them because then your, your capacities for relational attunement will grow. Because if you don't respond to them, they'll stop playing with you. So you have to learn to be there, right? Okay. Number six then is multiple nurturers and mothers. We know from all sorts of research with animals and humans that if mothers don't feel like the community is supportive, they're not going to be as responsive. Right? So we are all responsible to help mothers be responsive. Our ancestral ratio some people say it's three adults to one baby. Some say more than that. Uh, so one quote here. Children do best in societies where child rearing is considered too important to be left entirely to parents. We have forgotten that too. Yeah. 
number seven, responsive relationships. This is the interbeing, the ability to co-regulate. The baby cannot regulate themselves. They're too young. They need to have someone help them learn to calm their systems and then create a, a personality that's calm. If you leave babies to cry, you're creating a very ah, kind of personality, very reactive. You are, you know, you're shaping the personality and the being of that child. So you want responsiveness. And that's why you need the community to do it. It's too hard for one person, mother, oh my gosh. Or for mom and dad even. You need more help. And we know that responsive relationships are so important. Every research um, that's done with children controls for this. They assume it's important, and we do too. And then we find that these other elements of the nest are also important. Nature immersion and connection. That's going to foster receptive intelligence, the ability to hear, to pick up on the signals of the animals, the trees, the weather. And you're going to feel much more mentally healthy. We co-evolved with nature. We didn't co-evolve inside of four walls. Yeah. That's abnormal for us. So. Um, it's going to make us sick. We call it nature deficit disorder, when people don't feel connected to nature, and unfortunately it's still spreading. Number nine, oh, we have, uh, sorry, that was right, 28 days of nature connection, so you can, well, this is based on an experiment we did with college students, university students, and each day you do something different to try to remember you are a body, you are an earth, Here's your relational connection to nature, right? Okay. Next. And then the last one is routine healing practices. As the animal who can make choices, we often make choices that are harmful to ourselves, to others, to the natural world. We need to rebalance ourselves. The Bushmen, um, the San people, um, when they're asked how often they have uh, ceremonies, they say, oh, once a week. Oh, unless there's grieving, then every day. So we have to remember again that we need the communal um, ceremonies. If you don't have the communal ceremony, you can do it yourself, but ideally you have a community. We have 28 days of self-calming for people who are get very socially anxious or are depressed. This is something that will help you as well. This is that involved us. Okay, go ahead. We have some data. I just have one piece of data. What we looked at was um, the history of the evolved nest in the mothers that we are studying with children, longitudinal study. And then we asked them also about their adverse childhood experiences. We call that ACEs, it's something that's studied in the United States. High ACEs across the country. Okay, cool. All right. So this then shows you, and then we look at that vagus nerve how well that vagus nerve I mentioned earlier works, right? And we looked at um, the adversity they have that they report in childhood, and that negatively affects their vagus nerve. But then the more they had of the evolved nest, it moderated the negative effect. So that's the positive news, right? If you can re-nest yourself as an adult, it's also going to help you. So our wellness promoting heritage, you see that as the cooperative companionship. I'll keep going. Ah, we can intervene at every point. Should, should we go? Um, so wherever you are, if you work with children, you can and mothers, families, you can help them with nesting, you can help heal as a therapist, you can uh, help adults find their compassionate side, their nested side, and then help communities attend to the nest. We have several movies. You saw the first one, The Breaking the Cycle. The next one is The Evolved Nest. It's eight minutes. And the third one is Reimagining Humanity in 12 minutes. So they're intended to help us, oh, realize you don't have to be so miserable. <laughs> right? You share the links uh, in the chat room. So okay, so the, the links will be in the, in the chat. Okay, go ahead. And we have a self-directed curriculum. Uh, for on the Evolved Nest with podcasts and essays and videos and how are you nested today and what can you do in your community. We also are creating a nesting ambassador program so people can 
uh, learn about the nest, and then wherever they are, what kind of work they do, they can be an ambassador for their community, their workplace, and so on. We have a child care checklist for young um, daycare centers, young children's centers, how much they're following the nest, you can see, okay? And this is the wellness promoting pathway. This is our, you saw this on the handout, uh, child well-being is central to our species. It's a central concern, a sacred responsibility. You meet the basic needs through the evolved nest. This is all maintaining connectedness throughout life, promoting health, fostering heart-mindedness, but also the kinship worldview, which I'm going to talk about in a second, and an individual community know-how for how to live compassionately and regeneratively. So this is the part that I haven't emphasized, and that, let me just say, so it's not just human-based, right? It's like we're part of the Earth community. So the kinship worldview, we understand then that every creature is part of an interacting dynamic whole. All our relatives deserving of respect, the ant, the, the flower, the tree, uh, the insect, right, the fly. And um, it helps us develop then our whole pathway is to understand that we are part of the kinship of the planet. So two worldviews, I mentioned these earlier. Um, this is what Robert Redfield identified. There's only two now. There used to be three because the Asian countries were not so oriented now, but they've shifted. So this is the dominant culture on the right from the 17th century that humans, uh, well, the world is fragmented, disenchanted, and amoral, the cosmos. Uh, only humans have spirit. Oh, oops. Only humans matter. Humans are the pinnacle of creation or evolution. And what do they know how to do? Be intellectual. <laughs> and they're very restless. They don't feel at home on Earth. They want to go to Mars. <laughs> they dominate nature. They make the landscape conform to these abstract ideas you know, I, uh, that we make up. And then they hoard resources from the animals, but also from other humans. This is abnormal for our species. It's only recent, the last few hundred years. <coughs> Um, all our ancestors were on the left side. The cosmos is unified, sacred and moral. Spirit pervades everything. We are mutually related with everything. Humans are the younger siblings. The mosses have been here for 400 million years. We have much to learn from all these other creatures. We have relational intelligence. And we feel placeful at home on Earth. We fit in with the local landscape. And the bio community is our partner, not our, you know, slave. And we share with humans and not humans. It's just, of course, it's just so natural because it comes out of that pathway, the wellness-informed pathway, nestedness, well-being, uh, heart-mindedness, and regenerativity. So we have now a worldview literacy site. We just started this. Um, where it contrasts the worldviews, and we have 50 different manifestations of the worldviews, and you can think about, well, what do I do in my life, or what do I see, and then gradually move over into the indigenous perspective. Okay? Right. Uh, in a recent paper, I put more things together. <laughs> so what I've been talking about is developmental nestedness, mostly where the infrastructure, what the baby or uh, child experiences is fostering a certain epigenetic pathway, health pathway, and then the structures and institutions support nestedness, and the stories of the culture, uh, superstructures, also support nestedness, right? This is really important. But that's not all of our heritage. Our heritage is also to take up ancestral wisdom, not just the nest, but in particular to local landscapes, and always concerned for future generations. We don't make decisions that are going to harm them. Right, so this is horizontal nestedness. And then there's vertical nestedness. We follow the cycles of life, earths, patterns, laws. And then we connect to the spiritual realm, the cosmos. So I call all this together deep nestedness. We can return to this. We just have to have a mindset about it, realize that we don't have to be where we are, 
There's so many things we can do, and each one of us can do something. And this is um, more information. We have books, The Kinship Worldview, Restoring the Kinship Worldview with a colleague, Evolve Nest book. Uh, these are, um, this is being translated into seven languages, and the kinship to um, German, I think, so far. Neurobiology, we have uh, my colleague Levi Farias, who's translated the first two chapters into Spanish. And then these films have all have, um, I think they're all in Spanish and English, and then there's captions in 15 languages. So um, please help yourself. It's a nonprofit, it's for you. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn, for having me. It's such an honor to be with you. And Linda, thank you. Have some. That's yes. wonderful. Thank you. But stay there. Yes. We'll have some questions, perhaps. Are there questions or comments from the uh, group in uh, online? Yes. Yeah, in the chat there was one comment. Mm -hmm. uh, let me look at it. Yeah. Brian it's Ward it's wants to say something. Rene Hattar. Rene Hattar. Yeah. Beautiful presentation, Garcia. Oh, thank you. In the identified with so many memories from my childhood. Oh, good. I'm so glad. Yay. I really enjoyed the finest. Oh, that's good, good. Thank yes. you. Yeah. I also myself. Brian has a question. Brian has a question. Yeah. No, sure. Brian, you can unmute yourself. Hi, I'm going to turn it on the speaker. Yeah. You know, Brian, if you're hearing yeah. us, you can unmute yourself. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, yeah, it's really interesting to to listen to that. That was very interesting. It was really good. Right. I I um um. There's a lot of mother stuff there that I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I'll go with it. On it's, it's it's very interesting. It's really good and all. But um, what I wanted to do, and, and I, after hearing your conversation, your, your talk there was um, to, to, to throw um, an angle to it that, that might seem odd or might seem irrelevant to you. And I, just tell me, tell me if, if that's true. But my, my concern about a lot of well-being has got to do with the, the the wealth distribution associated with bear, uh, excessive consumption. So, you know, we're, we're eating too much because we have to feed each other with money. And, and, and I'm just putting it back into the human side of what you've said is and I, and I try to think of the words that make sense to me, is the, the runaway food innovation, you know, with, with competition and competitiveness at the food level, you know, where we're innovating. I, I go into my supermarket and I only walk past 80, um, 20% of the shelves because 80% of them are bad, processed foods that I don't really want. And this is this is consumption that is affecting our mothers and our families and our people and and that 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 um, it's an addiction. You know, salt, fat and sugar is an addiction that affects our very family life. If you know what I'm saying. Yep. If you can understand that. And I wanted to just make that point and ask you, how much is our food, you know, the, 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 the capitalist or the, the, the consumption and money distribution nature of our food affecting our families? Uh, I think you're right. It's really having a negative impact because it's not nutritious, mostly, and has a lot of toxins in it um, that undermine our systems in all sorts of ways and even cause cancer and 
all the pesticides and herbicides and fungicides that are poured on the products, the processed food products, especially, especially in the states, um, are really going to undermine our health. Now, uh, I was just at a conference uh, two weeks ago, and it was Local Futures, Planet Local, and their emphasis, and I think also Evelyn, uh, <clears throat> emphasizes that we have to change the systems that are forcing us into eating these bad food products. And part of that is the subsidies. Uh, the governments pay corn uh, and fossil fuel companies. They give them subsidies. Uh, and then they pour on the, the um, fossil fuel derived pesticides and such on our food. So it's, uh, the emphasis local futures have is to go back to local food production, and, which would be organic, uh, because when you uh, are, are a farmer that's responsible and follows the cycle of life, you don't need all that junk on your food, and you don't use hybrid seeds, which are developed to resist the, the negative effects of the pesticides and herbicides, right? And then they don't have any offspring, so you have to keep buying seeds from the companies who are making us do these crazy things. Uh, so we have to work at that level also. So my area is, because I'm a psychologist, I work more at the family relational uh, level, but we need all the community organizers <laughs> and the people who work at the level of government, of politics, to help us get back to not subsidizing all these things that are making us sick. So it was also pointed out that you know apples maybe are grown in, in Germany, and then apples are grown in New Zealand, and Germany sends their apples to New Zealand, and New Zealand sends their apples to Germany, and it's cheaper to buy the imported apples than your local apples. Why? Because of subsidies, and because the cost of shipping is discounted. Nobody's paying for the cost to, to the climate or to the community. So the system is just all insane. <laughs> it's not oriented to life, uh, life creation. It's not oriented to well-being. It's oriented to capital. Raising GDP. So yeah, you, you send your apples overseas, your gross dom domestic product goes up, GDP goes up. Well, look at we're so wealthy. It's, you know, the, the elephant in the room is is the redistributive nature of money, you know, like 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 sharing wealth and sharing well being through money. And um, can we not come up with a better global method? Yeah. That's all I was saying. Yeah, good. Thank you. All right, everybody work on it. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Comments? Yes. Yes, uh, thank you so much for that uh, beautiful presentation. Uh, well, just a um, contribution, just to add. You know, the issue about um, the nest, from my perspective, is really important. So you'd find out that um, irrespective of your age, your sex, or whatever the case may be, um, we all need to be together. You will find out that today there is a lot of families that have gone apart, communities, societies, you know, because we don't see ourselves, you know, as one people. Yeah. So that is why um, your submission is important. But also, what is um, the cause, you know, for society to be apart, or maybe let's say for us as humans, you know, in general, to be apart, um, is that um, one of the things has to do with um, gender responsiveness, the way we respond, you know, to issues around gender. So, for example, if you go to Africa, for example, you find out that um, there are specific roles, you know, and responsibilities that are being assigned to either a man or a woman. So, because of that, we experience a huge gap 
you know, in terms of uh, our individual abilities. So that again, you know, contributes in terms of limiting one's potential. So, for example, if you if you if you go to my country Sierra Leone, and then you say a nurse, everybody feels when they say nurse, it should be a woman. So if they say a nurse and a man stood up, people begin to look at you. You understand? So everybody feels that man should become a doctor and a woman becomes a nurse. So to me, I feel those are all forms of humiliation, you know, because society keeps suppressing um, primarily or essentially um, our women. You know, they are less competitive. So they themselves, they have accepted you know, the position which societies have actually placed in. So we all have um, a role to play in order to ensure that we uplift, especially our young girls and women, so that at the end of the day, because they are the most vulnerable in the community, so that at the end of the day, they don't feel um, left out you know, but also they feel that they have an essential part to play. So that's my contribution. Beautiful, thank you. Okay. Well said. Uh, in the United States, the males are suffering more recently, uh, surprisingly, because there are a lot of programs to help females, girls and women, to advance, at least, you know, in the upper privileged classes. Uh, and um, so there's a lot of boys that feel, and men, feel left out and they're very angry. And so there's the manosphere, incels, other organizations where they foment hate of women, particularly, um, for um, not providing whatever they want. Um, so our heritage is to live in multi-gender, multi-sex, multi-age uh, groups, not to isolate. And what we do when we isolate um, boys from girls or men and women is we forget how to get along, uh, but also males' testosterone levels go up when they're isolated with men. Because the, that's just what happens. That's why you isolate men to go for a raiding party. You have to be away from the community for a while to build your testosterone, and then what, what happens, you get more rivalrous, your empathy goes down. So my, I think a lot of the rules we have that are guiding us in the categories, <laughs> the categories that are, uh, that you mentioned, what a girl is like, a boy is like, a man, a woman, uh, these things are um, developed by these isolated male thinkers, right? The philosophers, most of the philosophers in Europe whose ideas are pervasive in our culture were bachelors or clerics. They didn't have families. They didn't do the, you know, the holistic way of being. So my proposal is that babies should be in every boardroom. Do not isolate men alone. Bring in the children because then they will, their empathy will go up. Testosterone will be manageable. <laughs> so, there's so much to do. There's one more thing to do. Yes, Jeffrey. Well, um, I really appreciate in the word nestedness because it really gives us a clear idea. Uh, yeah. And then that, that historical uh, legacy that we have that um, to um, but uh, reorient ourselves uh, towards who we really are in terms of you know, our, our historical roots. So I really appreciate that. As I was listening to you, I was thinking of my uh, people in Japan and uh, the contrast we have uh, where young mothers are isolated. Yeah. And uh, the ideal uh, is to marry and get a home and the husband is away from the home all, all day, 
So the mother is caring for the child alone. No grandparents. And, and you know, uh, no grandparents. And so they get isolated and then they become violent toward their oh. children. Yeah. And they, they know it's, you know, they, they don't want to be violent against yeah. the child, but there's so much stress yeah. and they take it out on the, on the child. Mm -hmm. So you have a situation of isolation at the core of a family. But on the other hand, um, I have been working with homeless people uh, and the homeless people have been uh, broken, you know, yeah. uh, in terms of um, human relationships or they, they doubt their value in terms of society. But what you find, uh, I'm not, I don't go all the time, but the, uh, the activists who help the homeless, there's sort of a nest. They, they create a kindness, uh, and the activists are very careful not to intrude on the privacy of the, of the homeless people. But they're so kind, and they, they, they look out for each other. It's, you know, that, that instinct of, of yeah. building a, a nest together. Yes. Um, I, their situation is not, you know, they're isolated and they're, they're hurting um, on the one hand, but they have this connectedness that they, they nurture, that they know what each other is doing, and there is kind of an empathy for each other yes. because you're in the same boat. Yeah. So I'm just thinking of that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, sometimes when we are uh, in overstressed situations, like maybe a tsunami or earthquake comes, people then get back into their connectedness. Yes, that's what we, we see in people who study uh, these events. Uh, people forget, you know, that, oh, I'm the superior one or I'm the, you know, the educated one or whatever. No, you just help. You know, you're connected. You've got, you get back into your oneness, your sense of oneness. And so whatever we can do to help people do that, and hopefully not such stressful situations, um, we can then improve our future. Thank you so much. Thank you, 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 thank you.